afternoon and uh, welcome to the IISS US. Uh, my name is Bryce Campbell. I'm the managing, managing director here. I apologize for our uh, slightly uh, late start. We have important international matters uh, at hand. <laughs> kept this uh, from getting started right away, but I'm very excited uh, that you're all here this afternoon. Uh, thank you for those uh, following the webcast or watching this on YouTube later. Uh, great to have you all here at the IISS. So we are here today to talk about the possibility of an arms race uh, in Asia. Uh, as I was just mentioning to Christian, this was uh, a theme that was sort of bubbling in the background of our recent Shangri-La dialogue in Singapore. Um, and for those of you that don't know, the Shangri-La Dialogue is a regional defense uh, conference that the IISS uh, puts together in Singapore every year. Um, this is our 13th edition uh, this year, uh, and it featured remarks from both Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of Japan, as well as uh, U.S. Secretary of Defense Hegel. Uh, and uh, it was a rather tumultuous uh, weekend, um, but uh, so yeah, this issue of what's happening in the security scene in Asia is very much at the forefront of what the Institute uh, is working on, particularly uh, Christian here. Uh, I just wanted to highlight two recent publications that came out uh, in, uh, I guess, along with our Shangri-La Dialogue, we had two related publications. Uh, the first is Beyond Air Sea Battle, which is uh, one of our latest Adelphi series books. Uh, we'll be doing uh, an event on July 17th with the author here as well, uh, but this uh, was launched at uh, Shangri-La, as well as uh, one of our dossiers. This is the Regional Security Assessment uh, 2014 for Asia. Uh, both of these publications, uh, our members will know, uh, are, uh, they should have received the Delphi series. The dossier should be on its way. Those of you interested in purchasing a copy of either can talk to our folks at the front desk. Um, with that, I will introduce uh, our two speakers. Uh, we will start with Christian Lemire, who is our Senior Fellow for Naval Forces and Maritime Security based in London. Uh, Christian previously served as the editor of James Intelligence Review and James Intelligence Weekly, uh, while simultaneously managing a team of uh, security analysts for them. Uh, during that time, he launched James Intelligence Weekly, pioneered the use of satellite imagery and intelligence within open source magazines, and developed a quantitative global security risk system. Uh, his research focus was on East Asian security and maritime developments, uh, reflecting his earlier position of genes uh, as an analyst uh, for Asia beginning in August 2004. Uh, joining him today uh, is Douglas Paul, who is the Vice President for Studies and the Director of the Asia Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, Douglas previously served as Vice Chairman of J.P. Morgan Chase International and was an unofficial U.S. Representative to Taiwan as Director of the American Institute in Taiwan. He was on the National Security Council staffs of Presidents Reagan and George H.W. Bush between 1986 and 1993 uh, as Director of Asian Affairs and then as Senior Director and Special Assistant to the President. Uh, Dr. Paul held positions in the Policy Planning Staff of the State Department as a Senior Analyst for the CIA and at U.S. Embassies in Singapore and Beijing. Uh, he has spoken and published frequently on Asian Affairs and national security issues. So we are in for uh, I think a fantastic uh, conversation, and I will turn it over to Christian to get us started. Thank you very much, Bryce. Um, hello to everyone here. Um, I'm just going to give 10 minutes of quick remarks, and I think Doug will then um, uh, respond and uh, correct me in various ways, and then we can have a, an open Q&A. Um, so the topic of today is, uh, is there an arms race in Asia, uh, which is um, very much a topic du jour um, for uh, the Asian security community generally. The first question is really you know, why are we interested in it and why do we care? And I think it's because arms races are often, although are not necessarily inherently destabilizing, um, and can fuel um, security dilemmas and concerns uh, amongst uh, regional states and obviously increase the costs of any potential conflict that may occur. So they both increase costs and the probability of a conflict uh, occurring in time. The phrase arms race is one that gets bandied around uh, fairly regularly and um, with some abandon. So I think it's important to define exactly what we mean by it. Um, and in its most basic form, an arms race is simply a competition in military procurement uh, between nation states uh, with no specific end goal. Now, there are other aspects of arms races that are often attributed to the phrase, uh, and one in particular is the idea that arms races are uncontrollable. Again, that's not an inherent aspect of arms racing per se, uh, but it is often the case that uh, arms races and those 
more classical arms races, such as the UK-German naval race in the early 20th century uh, and the uh, Cold War arms race, um, have seemed to have, uh, did seem to have uncontrollable uh, dynamics involved in them. That's partially because arms races are, uh, again, often but not always uh, driven by security dynamics, um, and that is the vicious uh, circle of security and power accumulations um, that can occur when countries start to uh, be concerned about their security from potential rivals. Um, I would argue that we are, uh, to some extent, seeing military procurement competition in Asia, and to some extent that is being driven by uh, security quandaries, if not dilemmas. Um, but I would question that we are actually in an arms racing uh, moment. I think the phrase itself is a very uh, historically uh, important one, and it carries a lot of baggage with it, so I think we should be careful about uh, using that. But first, the evidence for uh, arms racing, or at least military procurement competition, is fairly stark in Asia. You know, Chinese defense spending went from about uh, 55 billion RMB in 94 to more than 800 billion uh, in 2014, just 20 years later. That's just official budgetary spending rather than uh, total spending. So we have uh, increases of uh, a couple of thousand percent in two decades, which is fairly uh, significant. And we have in recent years begun to see more significant uh, defense spending in other Asian countries, largely as a reaction to the growth and rise of China. Um, so Vietnam and Indonesia, for instance, in 2012, both increased their defense budgets by more than 25%. And even Japan, um, which has obviously for a long time suffered from economic malaise and is constrained by its pacifistic constitution, saw its first defence budget increase for more than a decade in 2012, uh, and its largest defence budget increase for two decades last year. Japan is also going through uh, a military reform programme that will likely lead to a uh, more normal military posture uh, as one, one might see in other countries as well. So there are clearly increases in defence spending occurring uh, throughout the region, uh, and I think it's also clear that some of this defence spending is uh, driven by bilateral um, security dynamics um, between the various countries. Uh, purchases of certain equipment, such as uh, submarines by Vietnam, uh, are clearly designed to counter the surface hegemony that we see in the Chinese Navy, um, and uh, are therefore uh, fueling the action-reaction dynamics um, within uh, the region. Similarly, Japan's um, indication it will purchase two more submarines, uh, another anti-air warfare destroyer, um, Global Hawk UAVs and other uh, equipment that would be useful for defending uh, the uh, Southwest Islands uh, against China is clearly directed towards uh, defeating or deterring uh, Chinese aggression. Even countries such as the Philippines, which have traditionally not given a lot of money to their defense spending, uh, are purchasing uh, types of equipment to improve their maritime domain awareness and their maritime uh, capabilities. So. Uh, yes, I agree that there is a, a level of military procurement competition occurring, and yes, I do agree that there are um, certain uh, increases in defence spending that could be seen as alarming, but I would add certain caveats to the idea that there is an arms race in Asia. Firstly, I think it's important to uh, note that there are lots of different relationships occurring within Asia. Um, so to talk about a regional arms race in Asia um, doesn't seem to make much sense. The Sino-Japanese military competition, for instance, is very different to the Sino-Vietnamese uh, or the Sino-Philippine one. Um, and there are also differing motivations for some of the purchases that we see in East Asia, partially because of the different relationships they have. So for instance, while we can say that Vietnam purchases six kilo subs, it's clearly designed to act as a seed and our capability um, in reaction to China's growing surface capabilities. Malaysia's purchase of two submarines is not as clearly um, designed to counteract China's uh, surface dominance and arguably was um, purchased simply because Singapore has submarines. So uh, there, there was a sense of you know, bilateral rivalry uh, for prestige between the two countries uh, and not necessarily uh, clear military strategic uh, motivations for it. Um, further, I think uh, many of the purchases being made by countries that are not China um, are, could be seen as defensive um, and uh, are very much in the vein of what the American military has recently come to call anti-access area denial capabilities. So this includes things like submarines, anti-ship missiles, um, fast attack craft or missile craft being purchased by Vietnam uh, and the Philippines as well. Uh, and I think that's an important distinction to make. Uh, Rob Jervis in 1978 talked about the offense-defense differentiation, um, so that even in uh, a region or relationship where there appeared to be arms racing, as long as both sides were clearly aware that one side was buying purely defensive capabilities, there was no security dilemma that could be created, and therefore uh, it would hinder the possibility of a race uh, in arms procurement. Um, and finally, I would say that, uh, yes, there have been large increases in defence spending in the region, um, but there are still remarkably low levels of defence spending across the board uh, in Asia. 
Japan, for instance, even though it is noted that it will increase its defence spending over the next five years, still maintains a defence budget about 1% of GDP. Uh, similarly, Indonesia is uh, roughly 1.2, 1.3% of GDP at the moment. Uh, the Philippines is increasing its defence spending from an extremely low base. Um, so uh, I think it's difficult to talk about racing when people aren't going very fast. Um, and I think, uh, particularly in the Japanese context, it is clear that there are various uh, constraints on rapidly increasing defence spending uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, the final point I would make is that uh, another reason to uh, be cautious about using the phrase arms race is not only because of the lack of rapidity in some senses uh, uh, in defence spending increases and the urgency behind them, um, but also because uh, it's not a symmetrical competition. China's defence budget is now three times the size of Japan's and it clearly outstrips all other uh, Asian regional defence spending. So it's difficult to talk about an arms race when there's only really one horse in that race, and that's China. Um, and I don't think China will perceive, uh, certainly, defense spending by Southeast Asian countries to be a significant threat to its own uh, military capabilities. Uh, the Sino-Japanese relationship is slightly different, but um, for all these reasons, I think we can certainly talk about military procurement competition in Asia. We can certainly talk about action-reaction dynamics among some of the um, purchases being made. Um, but I would question whether the use of the phrase arms race is uh, useful or uh, historically and technically accurate. Well, very good. That's, um, there's, there's a, there are a lot of things Christian was not able to say in the course of a few moments he's just spoken. And I'll try to fill in some of those areas, but I, I want to identify myself with his reluctance to uh, characterize what's happening in the region as an arms race. There are definitely things going on. Um, he, he cited the very striking figures of rapid growth of the Chinese defense budget. But I think what needs to be reminded here is that China was starting from a very, very low base across the board in its capabilities in 1994. Um, they had been shocked by the outcome of the, uh, the liberation of Kuwait by the United States using what the Chinese call informatized uh, capabilities to uh, use smart bombs on targets and be able to direct munitions more efficiently in combat. Uh, and China has now been trying to catch up across the board. Now, pointing out that they had a low base doesn't mean we're not growing increasingly concerned. As we've seen, China has been moving very rapidly toward a much higher capability level in uh, advanced aircraft, ships, uh, anti-surface ballistic missiles, and anti-satellite weaponry in the last uh, seven, six, seven years. And so this is going to have a big effect. Another thing I would point out is that the denominator for measuring China uh, it should be different from that for Japan, Korea, and Indonesia, Vietnam. Um, China has 16 neighboring countries, and right now is in active uh, disputes with three of them. Most countries would think it was a bad idea to have three disputes going at once. You'd want to get them down to one or two anyway. Uh, so China has to spread its capabilities across a wider range of possible theaters of operations. So they will naturally come in weighing more and producing higher numbers of whatever it is they produce just because they are such a, a massive <coughs> continental presence with uh, troublesome neighbors virtually on every side of their, of their, their frontiers. Um, I wanted to also draw attention to that, but this is not something this, this phenomenon of um, defense procurement competition, which I think is a very good phrase, is not something confined just to the immediate area. We've had in the last couple of weeks, the Canadians have announced that but due to their concern about China, they've, they've created a notional budget for 28 new major warships and 116 smaller vessels. 116 are probably mostly Coast Guard on their own coast. But the, the 28 major warships are certainly going to have a Pacific orientation. And this is targeted to be ranged between Canadian $30 billion and $50 billion. And just uh, on June 15th, the Australians announced that they'd be uh, developing a new $35 billion Australian, that's $33 billion US uh, program to replace just six of their submarines. Uh, and that to do this, the Japanese and uh, Australians have notionalized and are in the process of negotiating technology transfer so that the very superior uh, air independent propulsion system on Japanese submarines plus some other uh, technical capabilities will be transferred to Australia 
uh, in, in, under the new rules for uh, uh, the new interpretation of the Constitution in Japan, which permits uh, military industrial technical cooperation and sales of some equipment for the first time in, in the post-war period. So there's a, there's a lot going on. My own preference in discussing uh, the notion of an arms race is to refer to strategic competition. But of course, when we're talking about strategic competition, we're really only talking about the United States and China. Um, and I, I would definitely try to avoid the term arms race at this point because it gets the blood rushing and people worrying more than they need to. The United States has a, a vast residual capability of Cold War and post-Cold War capabilities uh, throughout the region, well deployed. Uh, there are new challenges to a lot of these capabilities and uh, China's new um, what they call uh, anti-intervention capability, or what we call A2AD, uh, is going to make us re-examine some of our facilities, such as in Okinawa and elsewhere, and some of the ways we do business. But they're not challenges that we can't meet if we're careful about it and, and pay attention. I think the Obama administration um, struck the right note with this uh, discussion of the rebalance to the region. Um, it's sometimes called the pivot, I think, unhelpfully. Uh, but rebalance to take us out of the preoccupation with Iraq and Afghanistan and try to husband resources in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, this is not a promise to build up, although the rebalance is often called a military building. It's to protect or put a floor under where we are as there is a build down in the overall defense budget in the aftermath of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Um, this is very similar to a process that I was heavily involved in in 1989-90, which was called the East Asian Strategy Initiative. At that time, end of the Cold War meant we were going to really build down in Europe. German forces in Germany and elsewhere were going to be drawn down dramatically. And but we knew that Asia was a more unsettled environment, and therefore uh, we couldn't do the same kinds of things there in the hunt for the peace dividend of the post-Cold War period. So this East Asian Strategy Initiative argued against the um, the climate of the times. In those days, Japan was treated like the way China is often treated today, which is they were going to eat our lunch, they were going to take the free riders, all this. And we had to find ways of defending to the US Congress the maintenance of our facilities in Japan, uh, given that Japan was paying for a good part of the operations and, and the utility of having those facilities in Japan and the capabilities they gave us, but also in Korea and other uh, of our relationships in the East Asia Pacific region. That was a fairly successful defense of that budget, and I think the rebalance has been, has enjoyed largely bipartisan support in this period. So I'm not arguing, I wouldn't resist the notion that there is a, a we're falling off a cliff in our ability to handle China and uh, the challenges that it's presenting. Um, right now, if you pick up the newspapers on any week of the last few months, it's all about China's assertiveness, because nobody wants to say aggression, uh, so they say assertiveness in the South China Sea and vis-a-vis -vis Japan and the Senkaku and the Aoyadao Islands. Um, partly this is calendrical. Uh, the, uh, every year we have the Shangri-La Dialogue, our friends here sponsor, and that always brings out the, you know, the belligerent statements. And that's followed by Tiananmen commemorations. That brings out the belligerent editorials. And so there's a lot of bad press. And then a month from now, actually a couple weeks from now, the, Strategic and economic dialogue will be held in Beijing, and our large array of our cabinet will be there, and they'll all be saying nice things and presenting flowers to each other. And the tone will change a bit. So I, I, I urge you to be careful in overreacting to what's in the papers today and, and prepare yourself for some change in tone going forward. But that's all but prolegomenon to then say um, what we're seeing in China to me is not a sudden. Um, you know, the arrival of a new leader who's got a more aggressive program. Um, they are doing some things. They're having three arguments with their pretty good neighbors. Well, Ten years ago, they didn't have arguments with these three neighbors. So something new is happening. But I look back over time, and I see what China is doing is, some, is accumulating capabilities, claims, uh, perquisites that China felt it could not claim in earlier decades because China was too weak and uh, beset with other domestic problems. China's fixing a lot of its, not all, but a lot of its domestic problems, has much greater national resilience and capability 
and um, is fulfilling what they've been doing to different regimes under the Communist Party of China to uh, fulfill Chinese national aspirations. The Nine Dash Line, the famous Kaotong, that claims a lot of the South China Sea, which was an inheritance from the KMT government of the 1930s and 40s, and the Chinese appear to be unable to walk away from it. Um, in 1974, when the opportunity to seize the Paracel Islands from South Vietnam presented itself, China unhesitatingly grabbed it during the period when the Gang of Four and Mao were in ascendancy. Um, in 1988, when the Spratleys suddenly became available and Russia, or then the Soviet Union, had been persuaded to break its military relationship with Vietnam, China pounced on the islands then. That was under Deng Xiaoping. And then in 1994, after the American Treaty use of bases in the uh, Philippines, the base agreement expired. Uh, the Chinese pounced on Mischief Reef uh, when that is no longer protected by an alliance relationship with Manila. So the Chinese have been at this through different kinds of governments. That was Jiang Zemin, a different kind of leader altogether. You don't think of him as an aggressive kind of guy, but it happened under him. And China's been building capabilities. One of the things we saw this past uh, spring was the arrival of a very large oil rig off the Paracel Islands and waters both Vietnam and China claim. And people thought this was you know, a sudden indication of a new mood in Beijing. Well, this oil rig was procured in 1998 to $3 billion. And it was going to be used for something. And so I, I don't see this as a, a big departure. I see it as a very big part of a consistent effort to reclaim China's long-standing claims, long-standing uh, aspirations for the South China Sea. And then final point, uh, something we don't pay a lot of attention to is China has built a very substantial paramilitary maritime surveillance fleet, and they've consolidated that fleet in recent years. Um, you don't build these things overnight and then suddenly deploy them to the South China Sea, East China Sea. You lay the keels a decade ago or seven years ago, and China has built a huge capability, which now allows them, unlike all of their neighbors, with the exception of Japan, to put ships into difficult places and keep them there for long periods of time, despite the changes in the weather, the high sea states that, are, that emerge. So they create presence, and presence creates ownership and administration. So I would say um, this is a long-term ambition, long-term commitment capabilities that uh, we're dealing with, and uh, we've got to find a way of dealing with it, not in terms of what they do today and tomorrow, but longer term uh, with this grinding competition for uh, maritime and uh, maritime territories. Thank you. Very wonderful. Thank you both. Uh, so I think some agreement that probably don't want to rush into calling what's happening on Andre right, because of you know, established trends and patterns. One question that came to my mind was uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you know, following the, the news headlines week to week can have very different ebbs and flows in terms of the, the emotions on one side or the other. I wonder if from the Chinese perspective, uh, they might perceive the sort of constellation of US allies collectively posing a threat to their, to their rise. Do you have any comments on that? Well, the, the, the one, if you go to Beijing right now, the one theme that will hit you in the face like a sledgehammer from everybody, whether you know Harvard PhD teaching religion in Beijing or, um, or somebody in the PLA military academy is the same line. The United States rebalance has caused these little upstart countries around China to get bold and filled up with their chi, as the Chinese would say, and they're now, they're now going to um, resist China with American uh, collide, uh, collusion and uh, suiting America's purpose of containing China. Now, you try to have an argument with them and say, well, containment as we understand it meant no flows of people back and forth, no trade, was let the Soviet Union feed on its own troubles and the collapse of its own weight. That was the theme of the paper. And we have 240,000 Chinese students in the best American universities. We have an $800 billion trade relationship with growing in this cross investment. So it's not exactly containment. But you can't get around the fact that in China, they think this is really being orchestrated against them. And if you try to explain to them, well, actually, China had a great run between 1998 and 2008 with their neighbors. 
We have the code of conduct negotiations started, declaration of the code of conduct for Southeast Asia. They had very good state visits to Manila and to Japan. Um, lots of good things were going on. And then 2008, the American financial crisis became a global financial crisis. Uh, the Olympics gave China a sense of great pride. And then we started seeing China bumping up against its neighbors. And it was in that period, 2008 to 2010, when increasingly in consultation between capitals in Washington, China's neighbors were saying, we need you here more. And that was really the, the intellectual origin of the rebalance concept. Try to get back, and it started with Mrs. Clinton's speech in Hanoi at the ARF meeting, where she took on this question of uh, behavior in the South China Sea very directly. And I think that um, the Chinese have forgotten that part of the timing. They're now just seeing the rebalance in terms of what's happened most recently in their relations with the neighbors. So we're really talking past each other, the US and China. And one of the things I'm concerned about is that, you know, we had episodes sort of like this before. One recent one was 2010 when President Obama tried to engage with Hu Jintao, the then General Secretary of the Communist Party, over what North Korea was doing with sinking the Chanam Corvette and shelling him there in Doe Island and trying to get them to take some ownership of North Korean behavior and put some limits on them. As Clinton, excuse me, as Obama himself said, I'm having a dialogue of the deaf. It's not getting through. But in that instance, we had uh, on the Chinese side, their national security advisor equivalent, state counselor, Dai Bingguo, and uh, he, uh, he had some conversations with his counterparts in the US, Tom Donnell in particular. And they, they, the US put on the table the notion that you know, if we can get this under control, we could have a really good state visit to the United States for your leader before he departs office. And so there was, a, there was a, you know, an incentive on the table, and then there was someone you could talk to, in the case of Dai Bingo, who had the ear of his boss, but who understood when we said what our bottom line was, the others kind of understood. In the last year, we haven't had that. Neither side has it. There's no Dai Bingo replacement, and there's not under Tom Donald a replacement on the US side. So that we, we are um, more threatened by a dialogue of the deaf than uh, we should be at this time. Yeah, I mean, I think I would disagree with Doug that um, the perception in Beijing is certainly that the uh, US rebalance is, uh, I mean, they would say a form of containment. Um, I think uh, the phrase in circumstance would be more accurate because containment was a specific strategy for the Soviet Union. And <coughs> it's very different from Asia right now. Um, so, uh, interestingly, the US rebalance for the first time, really, in history has introduced bilateral action-reaction dynamics and competition between the US and China. Um, that's not to say that it's um, the policy that is fueling instability in Asia. I mean, arguably, it's uh, China's assertiveness um, uh, that is, is doing so, and therefore leading to the US rebalance rather than the other way around. But certainly within China, uh, the perception of the rebalance is very different to uh, the perception of it in Southeast Asia. Well, I'm sure there are many questions in the audience as well. Uh, we do have a uh, microphone, so I just ask that you uh, raise your hand if you're called on with the microphone, uh, state your name, your organization. We've got questions at the front. You can start here. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll take uh, two or three questions at a time, and then we'll ask uh, Robert Tredo with International Investor. What don't we know? Uh, we heard a couple presentations earlier this week from some people consulting the Pentagon that suggested that there's uh, quite a few developments that uh, we, we can speculate about, but we don't really understand fully yet. Uh, but we certainly see Chinese uh, mobility and expenditures in some areas that uh, we're at least concerned with that. So I wonder if any of you, you know, either of you could speculate on that. Bill? Thank you. Hi, Bill. I'm a snorkel from an aircraft. Uh, thanks very much for your remarks and great perspectives. Uh, I wanted to ask two quick questions. So you mentioned the um, Abe Abbott summit coming up on July the 7th and how Japanese submarine technology could figure as large as a deliverable. Do you see any quid pro quo for Australian technology uh, as a baked in deliverable for that summit? And with respect to Southeast Asia, our guys believe that 
most of the nations of Southeast Asia have followed a fairly predictable conventional arms uh, investment policy to build up their forces. That changed in Malaysia at the Sulu incursion in East Malaysia. They've broken away from the path and now investing more in counterinsurgency. Did your study uh, notice any trends in how the money is being spent in Southeast Asia? Thank you. Okay, one more question here in the front. Thank you very much. My name is Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. And the REPAC will start today in Hawaii. And this is the first time for China to join in the joint exercise. How significant it is uh, to improve US-China relations and also the Asian uh, security environment. Under the situation that the US Congress still poses the uh, legislative restrictions on the U.S.-China military exchange, how to establish a kind of uh, mechanism that could integrate uh, China into a uh, broader Asian security uh, framework? Thank you. Great question. So, uh, Christian, you want to go first this time? Sure. Um, so uh, on what uh, don't we know? Obviously, that's a question that's very difficult to answer um, because I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, certainly there, there will be a variety of clandestine programs that the Chinese are investing in. Um, the speed of technological, um, uh, not necessarily innovation, but technological technological growth in the Chinese defense industry has been remarkable. So actually things that we don't know are actually things that we are just surprised by the speed at which they've got to those uh, particular goals. Um, so things like ASAT weapons that were tested back in 2007. Um, you know, people were uh, surprised not only by the fact that they had uh, developed that capability, but also that they would be bold enough to actually blow a satellite up um, and cause the various issues through the space debris. Um, on uh, Japan and Australia, you know, the issue for Japan is that um, it has a very technologically advanced defense industry, uh, far more so in many ways than Australia. Um, so it's, I think it's difficult at the moment to pinpoint exactly where uh, the Aussies might be able to help the Japanese out. Um, but certainly there's plenty of areas of uh, joint um, uh, development that the two could, could engage in. Um, I think for the Japanese, uh, the benefits of uh, cooperation in the submarine program are not just in terms of developing their own defense industry and exports, um, but mainly uh, political and strategic as well. Um, and uh, building a stronger Japan-Australia alliance and normal relationship is, is really the goal there, rather than getting anything back technologically from Australia. Um, you know, Japan's um, desire to increase defense uh, relationships with the UK are perhaps more significant from a technological um, uh, feedback um, process. Um, there are certain things that both sides are looking at, in, in particular in terms of uh, guided artillery rounds that will be uh, very useful. Um, but uh, at the moment, I think it's, I mean, for me, it's, it's a bit too early to see what the Aussies might be able to give back to Japan. On how the money is spent in Southeast Asia, I mean, as I was saying, a recent article I wrote in Survival, much of the money currently is being spent on what might be called A2AD uh, by the various Southeast Asian countries. Um, so subsurface warfare, um, sea denial capabilities such as anti-ship missiles, uh, not so much in mine warfare and mine countermeasures uh, as yet, uh, which is surprising given how cost-effective uh, they can be and should be. Um, we're likely to see other uh, forms of sea denial um, uh, in air-launched uh, anti-ship missiles as well uh, at some point. Um, RIMPAC in China, I think it's, uh, it is significant that China was invited to and accepted um, uh, to attend RIMPAC, uh, and there are already several mechanisms that the US and China have on a bilateral basis to. Um, discuss various issues uh, militarily, and they, they've had them since about 98, uh, or at least the oldest ones um, since about 98. Um, the problem with those mechanisms is that they are often hostage to uh, political fortune. So if there are, is a downturn in relations between the two countries more broadly, um, those mill mill ties are uh, often suspended, as they were in 2001 after the EP3 uh, incident. Um, but integrating China into uh, the broader regional security and defense community is certainly a goal um, for all of the states uh, involved. Um, the problem is a, a significant lack of trust uh, on uh, both sides, but particularly from China, and therefore an unwillingness to uh, invite uh, 
other militaries and individuals uh, onto uh, onto their ships or into their bases or um, to coordinate uh, significantly with other militaries. You know, their defense relationship with Russia is probably their most uh, substantial and successful one so far. Uh, but even then, they're uh, still at a very low level of um, uh, joint exercises. Uh, the the recent naval exercise was in fact the first time they had a joint command in any of their exercises. So um, China is at a very early stage of being able to um, cooperate with and collaborate with uh, foreign militaries. So, um, recapitulating the questions of what Chuck that we don't know, um, that's a very common meme. I wasn't at the hearing yesterday up on the hill, but I um, might guess that transparency was probably one of the themes that was discussed. And I, felt, I find that that has become a kind of crutch for us not to do the work we can do, that China is a whole lot more transparent than we think it is. One of the problems is you know, our military experts don't read Chinese, and their military experts do read English. So there's an asymmetrical um, imbalance there right away. Uh, and the, in Chinese publications, the guys who work on these things, the good PhDs who are out there, um, there are only a handful, a small number of Americans who can work this stuff. But they say it's there. You can, you can find the material and answer a lot of the questions. Now, one thing we don't we know is not there is their, um, uh, what their indications and warnings would be for use of strategic weaponry. And that's something that we are fairly transparent about. Most nuclear powers are transparent about, but China is not. Because that's, that's one area where we really uh, would like to get into the family jewels, hopefully by having them volunteer. But it's uh, not necessarily going to happen easily. On the um, Australian deliverable issue, I too have not much to say. I was in Canberra last week. I spent um, considerable time with senior defense people throughout the week. And we talked a lot about what Australia might get from Japan. And the topic of what Australia might deliver to Japan never came up, uh, which may have been my fault for not raising it, as you have done. But it's, it just didn't come up. And I don't, I, I don't have a sense that there's a lot of thinking about that or concern. Um, there is a lot of interest, of course, in what um, this initial uh, exchange of technology may do for the heavy industries in Japan and their ability to acquire or to merge with or to create joint ventures with American and other defense firms down the road, setting a pattern for that, which could be um, very significant. Um, one thing um, that wasn't part of the Australian discussions, but you know. Japan is going to be in a position, they retire their submarines after 10 years. And Japan, could, they have a very steady reconstruction program to replace them. But they could stretch those out to 10 years more, 20 year life cycles with a yard refit at the 10 year point, and double their number of submarines in a decade. And that could be a very significant contribution to uh, the kind of conflict scenarios that you can work up for the East China Sea and elsewhere along the first island chain. So I think there's some real significance in, in those kinds of numbers. On the um, question from the way about the impact of course, uh, the, the story on US-China military to military di dialogue, you know, since the late 80s when that Tiananmen destroyed what had been a fairly intimate relationship at a certain level between the US and China, we've been out of cycle with each other. We, we wanted to talk and China has wanted or vice versa. And with the arrival of Xi Jinping, who's comfortable in a military uniform as the new leader, it's quite clear that the orders have been given, like it or not, you're going to talk to the Americans. Um, I, was in, I was giving a speech at the Academy of Military Sciences in Beijing in 2012, just after he took power. And I, unknown to me, I was invited to a dinner with the new guy in charge and all this stuff. And it was world of difference. I came back and spoke to a very high person in our military and said, you know, something new is going on here. There's, there's a real desire to talk, whether they love us or not, it's another question. They, they want to have some interaction. And um, this person who had been through all kinds of bruising relationships with the Chinese said, I don't believe it, they're all dirtbags. <laughs> and, then, and then this past spring, um, uh, uh, Chairman Dempsey went to China and he came back I think really convinced that there was definitely a new basis for expanding these kinds of things. And RIMPAC is an example of what's followed. I would, I would hope that we can not retract the legislation, because that's always hard to do, 
but find it sufficient flexibility in reading the legislation of the 2000 Defense Authorization Act uh, to allow a greater increase so that we can get to know people. Speaking to one very senior commander, I said, what, if this really works out, what would you most treasure in getting to know your Chinese counterparts? Is I want to have his cell phone number in my pocket. And so that's, that's one, one commander's measure of this. And we're, we're not there yet, we've got a long way to go, but that's a, a more hopeful prospect than we've seen for some time. Um, final part of your question was about Asian security framework. Um, you know, there's, a, there's been a tremendous amount of discussion over the last 15, 18, 20 years over what the post-Cold War Asian security framework would be like, and ASEAN held some hope in the ARF process, or the ASEAN Defense Ministerial Meeting Plus uh, as one, or the six-party talks on the Korean Peninsula might be the seed that would grow into a thing. And all of them are proving disappointing, and I think we're a long way from you know, China does not want an American-based regional security framework, and the U.S. and the rest of the region does not want a Chinese-based regional security framework, so I think we're a long way from, from being able to have something where we can actually practically cooperate. But you can start small with aid, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief uh, capabilities, and then see how you work shoulder to shoulder under some of these circumstances. We had an example of that with the Philippine typhoon uh, fairly recently. Great, so another round of questions. Start with uh, Rick. Yeah. Rick Grove, Rudder Associates, New York. Um, question for Christian, but Doug, given your background, I'd be interested in your thoughts as well. Um, you rightly touched on the uh, Japan-China relationship, China-Philippines, China-Vietnam. Um, they're very much the focus right now, rightfully so. But I'm interested in longer term, the implications of the Chinese buildup for Taiwan. Um, the year by year, the imbalance between China and Taiwan grows uh, militarily, and the uh, increasing A2D uh, capabilities of China vis-a-vis -vis the United States increase the risks to the United States of intervention should China move on Taiwan. So my question is, um, right now, the current Kuomintang government has, enjoys good relations with China, and I don't see uh, an issue at the moment. But short of a declaration of independence by Taiwan, with a new government down the road, short of that, is there, um, do, do you foresee any change in the Chinese calculus that could lead China to uh, try to pull off its own uh, Crimea sometime in the next decade? Um, Stanley Cooper. Reference was made to the arms race with the Soviet Union. Um, I studied in the Soviet Union. All I saw was military, and it seemed to me they couldn't sustain it. The economy couldn't sustain it. And in the end, that proved out to be the case. I'm looking at an article published in Xinhua a couple of days ago. China government struggling to meet fiscal target. Tax revenues coming in less than expected. By focusing so much on the arms buildup, are we missing what might be going on in China's economy, a weakening um, that would make an arms race unsustainable? I agree also on the very back. Yeah. Hong Kong with uh, Hong Kong Phoenix Television. Uh, Mr. Paul, you mentioned that uh, US actions in, uh, in the Pacific is uh, containment. Uh, but also uh, the U.S. is uh, uh, claiming they're rebalancing to the uh, U.S., which is evident by their actions or uh, their policies. So if not uh, containing China, then what exactly do you think uh, the U.S. is trying to achieve by uh, resorting to the uh, Pacific? Thank you very much. Okay, great. So we have questions on uh, the impact of Chinese military buildup on its relations with Taiwan and potential calculus for action there. Uh, potential weakening of the Chinese economy uh, and how that might undermine its efforts to uh, increase its military uh, capabilities. And then the uh, inevitable question about the, the true aim of the uh, U.S. rebalance. Why don't we go in the opposite direction this time? We did ask for Christian's views. We'll play along. On the Taiwan situation, um, 
it's, it's interesting that we've just had a recent publication of the second year in a row for the Defense Department's analysis of Chinese military uh, capabilities constructed by Congress every year. And for the second year in a row, they have not made mention of an increase in Chinese missiles opposite Taiwan. Now, whether that's you want to avoid subjects or, or some other editorial decision behind that or a policy decision, or it reflects there's no real change. I, I don't know the answer to that. But the, the continued uh, need for Taiwan to maintain a credible deterrence so that you don't create a situation that where one day the Politburo might meet in Beijing and say, you know what, they, they can't defend themselves. Why are we putting up with all this folder all? Let's get out of the business and take Taiwan back. And you want Taiwan to be in a position, Taiwan should want itself to be in a position to be able to resist that kind of intimidation to turn that. And uh, so the focus um, remains on hardening the capabilities they've got in the new threat environment and on developing some defensive capabilities. These are literally are truly defensive capabilities. They're not offensive capabilities against a, a, a weapons pin cushion as big as China. You know, you don't try to defend the small part, you have to defend around Taiwan. Uh, so I think uh, the likelihood of a Crimea is a separate question. I think. One of the reasons you won't have a Crimea is because Taiwan does still have credible deterrent when it's combined with the American uh, assurances that we will maintain the peace and stability of the Western Pacific and the invasion of Taiwan would not be consistent with the peace and stability of the Western Pacific, so an indirect com commitment by the U.S. Um, Mr. Coburg's question is about the fiscal challenge in China. I don't know what you were reading, but the fiscal challenge I'm aware of in China is that the localities uh, receive less than they're mandated to spend. And, and so they tend to go out and borrow or sell things they control, and they're, they're getting some corruption and other problems uh, trying to make that, that rubber band surround bigger and bigger obligations on the part of the local government when, when it's not growing. The government's very aware of this, and they're trying to find formulas that have been outlined in the reform program last fall to transfer more fiscal resources to the localities. The center has plenty of money to maintain a very good clip in arms development. I, I, China would find it hard to spend more money on arms because their, their military industrial complex is still relatively young and, and developing. Um, they would be wasting a lot of money, I suspect, if they were to, to pour much more into that area. Uh, but it's not a lack of resources. It's, I think it's not a lack of money. It's a lack of, of uh, talent, S&T, &T, r and all of these things that uh, are behind modern weaponry. Um, and for Phoenix TV, the, probably the single biggest contributor to bad ideas about American defense policy on the, in the Chinese media, uh, um, I, I'd like to say that it is not containment Encirclement was suggested by Christian earlier. Uh, that's a perception by China of encirclement. It's not an organized encirclement by the United States. But the U.S. was responding to demand in the region in part, and also foreseeing a long-term need for the U.S. to protect its interests, which are you know, at least 200 years old in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, that it's an area that does not have a, a natural security framework that will provide the peace and prosperity that allows each country to develop without wasting vast resources on defense. And the U.S. Uh, post-World War II defense structure in the region has allowed a lot of these countries to do very well, including China, without having to put a lot of money into defense or in conflict with one another. And so it's, it's been a, a cheaper option. Trying to keep that floor, not, not raise it, now, a, lot of, a lot is made, for example, Secretary Panetta at the Singapore IIS dialogue a couple of years ago talked about in 2020, 50% um, of American ships will be in the Pacific. Well, there was nothing new about that. It's going to be, where the number of ships is going down overall. And as they go down in the Persian Gulf and elsewhere, as the U.S. disengages, they're going to remain the same. And that's not a threat to raise it to 50%. That's a floor. And I, I think that's been commonly misunderstood in China. And I, I know it's been commonly discussed incorrectly on your, on your network, as I've seen the programs. 
on its own. Maybe this will give you a chance to correct some of your colleagues' reporting. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, to Rick's question on Taiwan, you know, I think it's interesting that Taiwan has not been discussed more in recent years because of the sino economy um, and uh, the agreements on various economic sectors. Um, but um, I, it is still the primary um, security concern for China, despite everything else that's happening in South China Sea, East China Sea. It's obviously the primary security concern for Taiwan. Um, I think the next election um, could introduce uh, a more interest in the issue of Taiwan uh, if the opposition uh, is able to win. Um, it's, you know, it's feasible, if not currently likely. So yeah, I think Taiwan remains a uh, potential flashpoint um, militarily and in terms of security. Uh, but I would say that taking Taiwan is not an easy military operation. Um, it would be extremely costly, it would be very bloody, um, and uh, once you've taken Taiwan, then you have to hold on to an island uh, which has 20 million people on it who are quite antithetical to the fact that they've just been invaded and, and are being occupied by China. And that in itself is not a very easy security um, uh, strategy to undertake. So the idea that China might uh, on a whim decide to invade Taiwan, I think is, is um, probably not true. Uh, and obviously there are various other reasons why Crimea is not an example. You know, Crimea, Russia already had 20,000 troops in the peninsula, uh, and so it was less an invasion, more a um, reinforcement. Um, the loss of Crimea is uh, um, very difficult for the Ukraine to, to deal with, but obviously um, Russian-speaking uh, Crimeans uh, did feel slightly more um, historically and emotionally tied to Russia than uh, any Taiwanese will to, to uh, mainland China. Um, so I think, and also obviously the loss of Crimea, again, uh, strategically very difficult for Ukraine, but it's not a life or death issue, whereas the invasion of Taiwan is uh, the loss of an entire fiscal entity. So um, I don't think Crimea is a good example for uh, Taiwan for all those different reasons. And I think that um, China will become uh, more dominant militarily uh, in its relationship with Taiwan, but I still think it will. It will um, feel taciturn about um, any particular military adventurism uh, around the island for the foreseeable future. Um, on China's economy, I actually agree. I think there are uh, not just economic, but other domestic challenges that the CCP faces, um, demographic in particular, um, ethnic uh, in various areas of the country as well, uh, which could well hamper China's uh, long-term growth and long-term stability as well, uh, domestically speaking. We have seen a structural slowdown, um, uh, and we're allowed to see more of those. If you look at the trajectories of all of the Asian tigers and Asian development stories in the post-war era, they follow a very similar um, path, and China is now just uh, beyond the extremely high growth TV uh, period and moving to a different, much more difficult structural um, changes economy. So um, yes, I think it may be difficult for China, it will definitely be difficult for China to sustain the kinds of defense budget increases we've seen over the last three decades. But equally, um, it is going to be the largest economy in the world, uh, and so if it was to spend the same amount of its GDP on defense as the US does, it would therefore have uh, a larger defense budget. Um, and that would necessarily involve some kind of um, competition between the two. Uh, on the containment of China, you know, I would just concur with uh, Doug that containment is not the right word for what's happening. In fact, if you look at what's actually happening in the rebalance, it's more of a rebalance within Asia than it is to Asia. Uh, and we've seen troops moved away from China than troops moving to China. 9,000 Marines being brought from Okinawa, and you have <coughs> a of 2,500 Marines in Australia on a rotational basis. Um, you have uh, four LCS in Singapore, and you have the development of um, some of the Pacific Islands for training and other purposes as well, and perhaps rotation to the Philippines. So actually, you've taken a big chunk of your Marines in Okinawa away from China, where they are more vulnerable um, to Chinese missile attack, uh, and provided greater strategic space for China in so doing. So, um, you know, obviously what's happening as a result of China's assertiveness is a shift in strategic um, thought amongst the various countries to be more uh, amenable to the US presence, and it's what Edward Lookback would call the, the logic of strategy is currently in play. China's uh, actions are creating not an alliance, but certainly a greater alignment of countries against China. Uh, that's not the fault of the US rebalance, that's the fault of China. Um, so any containment that China is currently perceiving, either through that alignment or through the, the US uh, rebounds to Asia, is, I think, uh, a misperception. Uh, I'd like to add just a couple of comments to what Christian's just said, which I completely agree. On um, this final point, um, Admiral Benedict Blair did an interview with the Saudi Shimbun that's available today, 
talks about how China has self-contained. Its, its actions towards its neighbors have long led to the reaction they're getting, and this is self-contained, not containment by the United States. On, on the Taiwan observations that Christian made, um, first, uh, today, or yesterday, you know, the first visit by a senior Chinese official, by any acknowledged Chinese official to Taiwan since 1949. And uh, so th there's a very high watermark being met today in the efforts to manage their cross-strait differences. Secondly, um, the question of Taiwan being a typical target, I love the illustration that was given by General Douglas MacArthur, who in 1944 was said, do, do you want to plan for an invasion of Taiwan or Okinawa? And he said, uh, oh, I've got 1,200 ships and 1.5 million men. Uh, Taiwan is too hard. Let's do uh, one or two questions very quickly up here in the front. It's going to be our lightning round. Thank you. My name is Jimmy Nguyen, the Council of Vietnamese Americans. I thank the IISS for this conference, especially for, uh, for the Shangri-La dialogue with the exchanges between uh, Lieutenant General Wang and our Secretary Hegel. Seems like China was not at all being um, having any effect of the quote unquote possible and not a false um, claim containment by the US. China is not afraid of the US at all. And um, I attended the uh, um, little talk about the recent DOD report, congressional report on, on China's military uh, advancement yesterday at the Hill. And I was informed that China has actually moved beyond um, its border and trying to expand um, and its build up its military weapons to achieve broader goals, not just within its sovereignty, but further than that. And I also would like to ask you for the strategic view regarding China expanding its reach to Putin, to India, and with its um, allies, Pakistan, the only ally Pakistan, and also North Korea and Iran. Uh, given that China is the only member of Asia and the Asia Pacific that has the capability, the submarine capability of nuclear weapons, um, how would you see the whole picture? I don't think the US has to worry about the thinking of we containing China, China's containing itself. Neither is true, because China is not self-containing, it's reaching out and the U.S. is continue to try to be quietly not containing. I don't think China is worried about that at all. Thank you. Great. So uh, let's do one more quick one, and then we'll let uh, our speakers respond. Greg Taylor, Arms Control Association. Uh, a question about missile defense. Uh, how does China react to the 14 new uh, GBI interceptors bound for Alaska? It's a very active Japanese uh, SM-3 Aegis. Uh, uh, development and uh, new South Korean interest in developing their own missile defense. Does China see this as all a reaction to North Korea or also to itself? And then on the part of, the, of China's neighbors, uh, what are they worried about with regard to China? Is it China's nuclear capable ballistic missiles or the, the massive number of conventional uh, warhead ballistic missiles? Okay, great. So why don't we field those questions as you see fit? And any last uh, thoughts you have? Um, <clears throat> on China expanding strategic reach, uh, yeah, it's natural that uh, the world's second largest economy <clears throat> and home to a sixth of the world's population should have great strategic reach um, as it grows. Um, I would point out that China is very bad at making friends, um, and <laughs> that's being proved in the South China Sea and East China Sea right now, um, which is uh, a shame for China and many other countries as well. Um, so even its uh, alignment with Russia, uh, I would hesitate to uh, read too much into that. Uh, Russia is extremely pragmatic when it chooses its friends, um, and uh, always has been, uh, and is a very transactional basis to uh, any relationship. So that, I, I doubt that that's going to develop into a particular strategic alliance, and Russia is already trying to diversify its relations in Asia, uh, particularly through Japan uh, and Korea. Um, so uh, the point being that yes, China will extend its strategic reach, um, but it has to be a little bit nicer to people if it wants to actually make any friends. Um, 
you mentioned also that it was uh, extending its um, military force beyond its borders. I, I presume you mean um, to the island, the Spratly Islands in particular. I mean, I would say this: it's very easy to vilify China, but um, when we see things like the ADIZ being announced in uh, November, and when we see um, various Spratly Islands being um, developed uh, currently, uh, these are things that all other countries have already done. So, uh, in Northeast Asia, Japan, Korea, Taiwan all have ADIZs already. In the Spratly Islands, China is the only occupant that doesn't have an airstrip down there. Doesn't really have an island. Doesn't really have an island, exactly. So uh, the fact that Vietnam throws up its hand and says, isn't it terrible China's building an airstrip when Vietnam had one for a couple of decades and is currently building great support facilities on its own islands in the Spratly Islands is a little bit disingenuous. Um, and I think uh, one should be careful to um, you know, criticize China where it is applicable, um, but also recognize that other countries are um, culpable to some extent in creating tensions within the South China Sea. Um, on missile defense, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think one of the issues China has with North Korea is that um, North Korea's um, uh, gains and brinkmanship uh, leads to greater reason for the US to be in Asia uh, for stronger missile defense uh, from the US and with the US allies, in particular South Korea and Japan, uh, and that is negative for China's strategic balance. So um, uh, it's an unfortunate side effect, and I think it's one of the reasons we've seen Sino-Korean uh, relations China and North Korean relations actually deteriorate uh, somewhat because they're unable to control North Korea anymore and they're seeing negative side effects from uh, their various um, slightly uh, uh, silly uh, policies. Um, what, in terms of what China's neighbors are most worried about, it depends on the neighbor really, I think. Um, certainly Vietnam and Philippines are much more worried about conventional weapons than they are about nuclear weapons. Uh, India. Um, is very aware of um, the uh, nuclear issue with China and is therefore trying to develop its own sea-based um, strategic missile capability. Um, but in, in, a, in an immediate term, it's much more concerned by the fact that it has a border that is not demarcated in any sense, and China has a much stronger military presence on uh, most of that border as well. Um, so I think it varies from country to country in what they're most concerned about. And I hope uh, Doug and I will disagree with something, because we've been agreeing much too much. Yeah, we have been, yeah. I'm left to just offer anecdotes again. Um, the, um, this, this question of the Indian concern about China, there is a nuclear dimension to it, as Christian has alluded to. I was, I was in Tibet fairly recently. And when you, uh, anything that goes toward the Indian border is highly developed in terms of pavement and communications and the like. Uh, the ability of China to put forces at that frontier is vastly more uh, uh, effective than the India counterpart. One of the things discussed in the recent elections in India is investing in some new units and some new infrastructure closer to the uh, Himalayan border. Of course, the Chinese do it from the position of being up on the plane, and the Indians do it to bridge by the way to go uphill. So it's a, it's a tougher challenge for the Indians. But it's, that's where their focus is really not so much on the nuclear as I can see it. And on the um, on the question of the North Korean. Uh, uh, or the reaction to the U.S. Uh, ABM capabilities, I have to claim a bit of parenting on that one. I um, was looking for a response to what was a, a period when China was recalcitrant about reining in North Korea's misbehavior. We wanted to find a way of getting the message to China in a way that they would really pay attention to, and yet would not pose a strategic force for instability. Um, we've shown restraint in developing our anti-ballistic missile capabilities. They've never come close to being able to uh, notionally threaten China's second strike capability. So that's, it's a, that's been self-restraint on our part. We could have done it. Uh, but we did want to have China pay attention that we're concerned about the growing missile and nuclear capabilities of North Korea. And this, unfortunately, will also have an effect on China's capabilities. So adding those extra launchers to Fort Greeley was an idea that I wrote up and then it got um, a warm reception. Uh, and I think it's, it's sent the right kind of message. And uh, we are seeing that in, in the uh, current strains between uh, China and North Korea. And next week, I think on the 3rd of July is the notional date that uh, Xi Jinping, the head of state and party of China, will go to Seoul, South Korea bypassing North Korea. The North Korean leader's been in office almost three years and has not been to Beijing and kind of the laying out of the hands by the, the communist pontiff uh, in, in China. So there's, there's a very powerful signal there that something big is changing on the Korean Peninsula in this relationship with China.
That was terrific. Thank you both very much. And uh, please join me in thanking our panel. For